Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Abortion in the United States right now is safe, legal, and common. But that's changing. Abortion rates are declining faster in Indiana than almost any other state in the country. Ahead, what's behind the dramatic decrease? In part two of our series on the costs of prison, we take a ride to the Wabash Correctional Facility. Oh, I've been riding the bus to be going on five years in May. Prisoners do better and are less likely to return to prison if they get to see their families. But those monthly visits are something many families struggle to afford. We introduce you to a woman who's been helping families connect with their incarcerated loved ones for more than two decades. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Abortion rates are on the decline across the country. An Associated Press survey this week revealed abortion rates on average dropped 12% nationally. In Indiana, the decline was even more dramatic. Gretchen Frazee reports on what's likely causing the decline and what that means for young women in Indiana. When a woman becomes pregnant unintentionally, she sometimes ends up at a place like this. All Options is a pregnancy resource center in Bloomington, and its mission is in its name. The staff here try to present women with all of their options. So we do this by providing free pregnancy tests and peer counseling, material support like diapers and baby clothes, referrals to other kinds of community services. So if people are needing help with the utilities or needing a free HIV test, we'll be able to hook them up with those kind of services, as well as abortion funding. That last service is the most controversial, but demand for abortions has been dropping in Indiana. In 2010, the state saw just over 10,000 abortions. In 2013, the year with the most recent data, there were only about 8,000. That's a 20% decline. Likewise, the teen pregnancy rate has also dropped 20%. In 2010, there were 37 births per 1,000 teen girls. In 2013, that number was 30 per 1,000. Planned Parenthood of Indiana CEO Betty Cockrum says those statistics show girls are less likely to get in the position where they have to choose between an abortion or giving birth. And she credits that to better access to contraceptives. It's clear that the Affordable Care Act with the um, introduction of birth control without co-pays is making a difference. It's clear that the um, introduction of more long-acting reversible contraceptions out there as, as medicine advances. More and more women are aware of those, more and more women are availing themselves of those. But pro-life advocates cite other reasons for the decline, including new state laws. One category was cons consent information for women. In Indiana, for example, prior to 2011, we didn't have anything in writing that she had to get. So in 2011, we upgraded our law to give her some information in writing, much like you and I would get before we get any sort of medical procedure. That included giving women the option of viewing their ultrasound. In my day, I remember when Roe came in and we really thought it might be a blob of tissue or something. But in today's uh, generation, they've grown up with ultrasounds. They don't know any different. It's an ultrasound and something we share, we put on Facebook. We, and so social media and technology like ultrasounds has shown that that's a baby. Health experts say there's another possible explanation. Hoosiers could be crossing into neighboring states where there are fewer restrictions on abortions. Look at Michigan, for example. The state's abortion rate actually increased 18 percent from 2010 to 2013. Health officials say the number of non-residents getting abortions there doubled over the last year. I would love to see fewer and fewer abortions. I would love to see fewer and fewer women to have to go through that what probably for most of them is an agonizing decision. Katherine Brown is a health and sexuality educator at the Indiana University Health Center. She says abortion laws aside, Indiana needs a better system for educating young people about sexuality. We have so many good 
very effective, long-acting, reversible contraceptives now, meaning that you take it and it can last for years in some cases, IUDs and implants that last for years, that give all, not 100%, but nearly 100% protection. Do these young people know about the, these methods? I don't know. Schools in Indiana aren't required to teach sex education, and when they do, they don't have to teach about contraceptives. Instead, the state mandates schools teach abstinence from sexual activity outside of marriage and emphasize that abstinence is the only certain way to prevent pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. Here in Indiana, there, there is no, there's clearly no comfort with the whole conversation around sex ed and that that takes its that takes its toll it takes its toll in terms of um, young people's behavior it takes its toll in terms of the number of teen mothers who are giving birth and how all of that contributes to the cycle of poverty back at all options pregnancy center director Shelley Dodson says education doesn't stop at the school level she says helping women know what's available to them throughout their pregnancy and meeting people where they are is more effective than fighting abortions we want to be able to have these conversations we want to be able to place that moves beyond pro-life and pro-choice to how do we build empathy and the question is about how do we support people in all of their experiences the debate over how to best reduce the abortion rate will likely continue to play out at the state capitol next year. People on both sides of the debate say they expect legislation to be introduced that aims to further restrict abortions. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Tuition is going up at Indiana State University. Trustees approved a nearly 2% increase for each of the next two years. They say that's the minimum amount needed to continue to provide a quality education. Other universities have approved similar increases. Some, including IU and Ivy Tech, are also implementing tuition freezes for certain students. A hearing is scheduled next Wednesday for the murder case of IU student Hannah Wilson. 49-year-old Daniel Messel was arrested in April after his cell phone was found near Wilson's body. Messel's attorneys are requesting his trial be moved out of Brown County where Wilson's body was found. Wet weather continues to put a damper on this year's crops. A rainy spring delayed planting for some farmers earlier this year. And a report from the USDA says last week's rain and cooler weather resulted in slower crop growth. Some parts of the state got so much rain that fields are underwater, which could kill the crops. And it's too late to replant. Economists are telling grain farmers at best to expect to break even with a good yield. A group claiming to have contracts in place with Terre Haute is seeking more than $172 million from the city in a federal lawsuit. Highland TH and Overseas Lease Group claim Terre Haute agreed to pay them $700,000 for sludge drying purposes. The contracts are tied to a deal the Terre Haute mayor has been trying to negotiate with Powerdyne, a company promising to bring a facility that would turn the city's wastewater sludge into fuel the city could then sell. The State Department of Agriculture is launching an effort to help ensure more Indiana-grown food ends up on Indiana tables. Alexander McCall explains. A study released this week shows 90% of Indiana's food comes from out of state, despite the fact Indiana has the seventh largest crop market value in the country. That's why the state is launching a website that will serve as a virtual food hub network, linking local food producers to consumers on a scale larger than typical farmers markets. People working to create local food hubs say they're excited about the possibilities. It's all about cooperation as opposed to competition, that Indiana users would get together, work to work, develop relationships locally so that Indiana's produce and grow Indiana's own food. And state officials say it's not just the small consumers that want to buy local. Every uh, retailer, large or small, uh, they're all struggling right now to give the consumers the products they need uh, in terms of the buy local initiative. Everybody would like to buy within 50 miles of uh, where they live. That's not quite always possible, but uh, we, sh we strive to do that. The food hub can become the mechanism. State agriculture officials say they're also encouraging more farmers to start growing specialty foods like fruits and melons so they can meet more niche demands. 
federal courts are weighing in on the controversy surrounding the Environmental Protection Agency's proposed carbon emissions rule. A federal judge earlier this week rejected claims by Indiana and 14 other states that the proposed rule limiting carbon emissions from power plants was unconstitutional. The claims were rejected based on the fact that the proposal hasn't been finalized. The EPA's goal is to reduce emissions by 30 percent by the year 2030. Governor Mike Pence has said that standard will hurt the state's economic development. A former Indiana State University student who posted a false threat on social media last year won't face jail time. Rashawn Marshall Bowen posted a threat on the app Yik Yak, referring to a potential campus shooting at ISU in September. When police discovered the threat was a hoax, Marshall Bowen was arrested and charged with a misdemeanor count of harassment. She could have faced up to 180 days in jail, but instead took a deferred sentence and has to complete 40 hours of community service as part of her probation. Booms powerful enough to break windows rattled Indiana University's campus this week. It was part of an explosion demonstration IU police cadets participate in as part of their academy training. Cadets learned about several different types of explosive devices before watching an instructor set them off. They also learned how bomb dogs can help detect the dangerous devices. The course is aimed at helping cadets decide if they want to go into a special operations field. And Joe, they had to do that course far away from a residential <laughs> area so they wouldn't break any windows. And I'm sure only a small, a small part of the training that they had to do to do that job. Thank you very much, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Kirkwood Avenue is considered the heart of Bloomington, but some community members say panhandling and other criminal activity is jeopardizing the street's character. And we introduce you to a woman who's been helping families connect with their incarcerated loved ones for more than two decades in part two of our series on the cost of prison. Those stories plus Aviation Day in Columbus right here on Indiana News Desk. I can change the world with my own two hands, make it a better place. With my own two hands I'm gonna make it a brighter place With my own two hands I'm gonna help the human race With my own two hands I can hold you In my own two hands And I can comfort you Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Members of the Bloomington community came together this week to discuss homelessness downtown. WTIU's Casey Kuhn brings us some of the voices heard at the meeting. Dozens of Bloomington residents this week joined a public discussion aimed at addressing the issues of behavior on Kirkwood Avenue. City Council member Steve Volan arranged the constituent meeting as a response to an earlier meeting hosted by Nick's English Hut co-owner, Susan Bright. Bright was a panelist at Wednesday's meeting, along with a chair of the Bloomington Human Rights Commission and a member of Decarcerate Monroe County. At the meeting, Bright apologized for using the term bum commerce to describe criminal activity on Kirkwood. My intention was not to bring in the homeless fact of what's going on on Kirkwood Avenue. And ask the community members there to offer any ideas to reduce disruptive behaviors including panhandling. It's the students who are causing the problems with the people who are facing homelessness. Panhandling is growing across the entire state. This is something that's happening in cities throughout Indiana. It's not just Bloomington. I've been pushed, I've been shoved, my customers have been threatened. We gotta find a solution. The meeting brought Indiana University students, Bloomington property owners, and one homeless man, Ray Jordan. Jordan, as did many of the speakers, talked about how homelessness is a complicated issue to deal with. Don't put a blanket over all of us. Don't put a blanket over all of us. You know, deal with what's in front of you. 
Other commenters suggested creating a year-round homeless shelter, more police downtown, and getting more money to existing programs that deal with homeless people already. Joining us today is Byron Bangard, a member of the Bloomington Human Rights Commission. He was also on the panel at Wednesday's meeting. Thanks for joining us today. This is an issue that's mm -hmm. not old. It's come up before. Sure. But now it seems to be taking a, a little new angle and that businesses are starting to come mm -hmm. forward. What now? Will, will what happened mm -hmm. Wednesday actually amount to anything? I think it will. I'm, I'm very pleased to see the interest by the business community. Um, I think that many of them have a first-hand experience with the kinds of issues we're trying to deal with here, and some of their insights are going to be crucial to coming up with a solution. Uh, I happen to have uh, occasion to visit over lunch uh, yesterday with two members of the business community, one of them who lives across from Seminary Square or Seminary Park, and the other one who's on South Grant Street just off of Kirkwood. And both of them acknowledge that this is a complex problem. It doesn't involve merely or only people who are homeless. In fact, they may not even be the primary persons who are problematic in terms of the behaviors that are occurring in the Kirkwood area. Um, they perceive that there are people who are, you know, from various segments of our community and maybe some from outside who are possibly causing some of the trouble. But what really needs to happen within the mm -hmm. city to be able to make progress on this? Well, I think there's got to be a cooperative effort between the city, business owners, and the not-for-profits commissions like the Bloomington Human Rights Commission. We've had a long-standing interest in uh, the homeless in our community and we want to make them a protected category, not to protect any of the behaviors that people are objecting to, but to c make it clear that homelessness itself is not the problem, that the problem are some of these behaviors which have become associated with the homeless. Now there were a lot of suggestions made that night. What were mm -hmm. some of those that kind of stuck out to you? We, um, we talked about the police already sure. in that package. Well, I think that's a, that's a helpful uh, su suggestion. Uh, I think the kinds of things that Forrest Gilmore has pointed out about the success of Crawford Homes are really crucial as a solution to dealing with many of the homeless. But I don't think that will necessarily get to some of the other problematic behaviors we're talking about because I think a lot of those are not necessarily homeless people who are causing the problems that business owners are objecting to. And these two business persons that I spoke with both perceive that. They see that these may be others who are using the homeless as a kind of a, an, a scapegoat for their own illegal activities. A discussion I'm sure will continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for being here You're today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Last week, we told you about the staggering costs many families incur in order to stay in touch with their loved ones who are in prison. Money spent on phone calls and in-person visits quickly adds up. Reporter Barbara Brocher is back with us for part two of the series, The Hidden Price of Prison. Barbara, how do families cope with these costs? Well, it's certainly not easy, Joe. For many families, they're struggling to keep themselves afloat, so providing emotional and financial help to incarcerated loved ones isn't always doable. But there is some relief for families who are overwhelmed. This week, we introduce you to people who are dedicated to making sure prisoners and their families get the support they need. Once a month on a Saturday morning, Annette Barner and her two kids get up early to get on the bus. I've been riding the bus to be going on five years in May. But this bus isn't going to the mall. It's not taking them to the movies. It's heading nearly two hours southwest of Indianapolis to Wabash Valley Correctional Facility. It's a trip that takes the entire day, but one Barner insists on making. It means a whole lot to him. You know, if we don't come and see him, it messes up his whole month. They're here to see Barner's fiance, Floyd Teague. He'll likely be in prison for several more years after being convicted of multiple felony counts, including drug dealing. But when he's reunited with his family during monthly visits, Teague seems like a regular dad. He is the first one to show me that he really cares and show the financial support. All the support that we need, he gives to us. Seeing moments like this is what gives Cecilia Whitfield a sense of purpose. She's the one who helped Barner and her kids make the trip a trip they otherwise couldn't afford. This is my only way. Even though I have a car, you know, no one wants to put a wear and tear on their car. Whitfield is the woman behind the Use What You've Got prison ministry, which has been helping families connect with their incarcerated loved ones for more than 25 years. It's a struggle she knows well. In 1988, 
I was just so excited. My son had just graduated from Shatar High School and in June, and by August of 88, he was facing 40 years of prison time. Whitfield started the ministry after other women started asking her for rides when she went to visit her son in prison. You have daycare, you have, everything is on that mother. And um, um, they got everything, the food, the rent, so it's expensive to live out here when you have a loved one that's incarcerated. The rides became so popular, she and her husband had to borrow money to buy a school bus. Now the ministry uses several vans to transport families to prisons all over the state every weekend. People pay what they can for a ride. Whitfield never turns anyone away, even if they have nothing to give. For many, being on the bus with other families facing the same obstacles is a lot like therapy. The families are called the hidden victims because we know the problem, the trouble that our sons or our husband may have committed and they victimize someone, but no one thinks about the families, what we go through, the, the tears and the hurt and the pain and the shame and the embarrassment of having a child in prison on drugs, stealing. That's very hard. Studies have consistently found that maintaining contact with family members while incarcerated reduces an offender's chance of recidivism once released. A 2011 study by the Minnesota Department of Corrections found the likelihood of being reconvicted of a felony was 13 percent lower for inmates who received visits. LaDon Clanton knows just how important family connections are to prisoners because he used to be one. He now works at Public Advocates and Community Reentry, or PACE, an organization dedicated to helping offenders transition back into life after prison. For him, getting out of prison wouldn't have been possible without his family's support. You don't want to let them down as well as yourself. And then, you know, just, you know, just that you know, just that bond, that, that working relationship in achieving your goals is, you know, that's, that's, that's the foundation to success. He works alongside another ex-con and former PACE client, William Groves. Groves says he never expected to get out of prison and have a good paying job, let alone a place of his own. They're all things, he says, he couldn't accomplish without the support of his loved ones. I really thought when I was locked up that my life was pretty much over, that I had failed and that I was going to have to start from the beginning. It has not been anything that I've expected. Um, through the support of, of my recovery network and through here and stuff, you know, I have I've seen so many amazing things happen in my life. That gives Annette Barner hope that when Teague is released in a few years, they'll see amazing things happen in their lives too. Until then, she'll keep sacrificing her Saturdays so her kids can see their dad. It's extra motivation for Teague to stay out of trouble so he can come home. I notice when they're incarcerated, if you got someone who's riding you, coming to see you, you know, giving them some of your time, you know, they're, they're less in trouble down there. You know, they focus on what they need to do to come home because they want to be on the outside world. So, Barbara, as you said it in your reporting, if prisoners can spend time with their family while they're in prison, it helps keep them out of trouble when they get out. But then why does it seem like the state charges so much for them to keep in touch with their families? You know, it's the state is working with these companies that, that come in and provide these services. There are certain guidelines that say they can only charge so much, but, you know, they make money off this deal, too. It costs seven twenty an hour for a half-hour phone call, which doesn't seem like a lot when you're thinking of that one call but it really adds up after months and weeks, and it's a good chunk of money for people. They spend a lot of money going on visits, too. They buy food, it takes the whole day. A lot of them take money to use in the vending machines because they want to treat their loved ones, so it adds up really quickly, and a lot of these families just don't have the money. How about any financial struggles, struggles continue after prisoners are released? It depends on every unique situation, but for example, the family we told you about last week, they're hoping to get an offender, Stephen Snyder, out on 
house arrest. That costs money. There are fees associated with that. We know a lot of offenders who are released from prison don't necessarily have jobs lined up, so they have no source of income. There are certain organizations, though, like PACE and Indy, that work to try and get inmates' job and help them transition into the real world so that they do have a source of income. And then just really quick, what happens to those who don't get that financial or emotional support? Well, the Indiana Department of Corrections does pay for their basic needs, so that's food, clothing, and health care. Beyond that, not much that they'll be getting. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. And if you're in the Columbus area this weekend, you can see what it was like to fly in luxury almost a century ago. For fee, visitors can take a short flight in the small-sized plane nicknamed the Tin Goose for its unique metal shell. The Ford Trimotor was the first regularly scheduled passenger airliner to operate in the country, used from 1926 to 1933. This particular plane has a storied history. It's been purchased by mining operators, private owners, and museums around the world. There has never been a crash of a Ford Trimotor that was attributable to any kind of structural failure. They are built like a battleship. Uh, it's, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite different from modern, modern airplanes in its flight characteristics but I'm lucky enough to have a fair amount of experience with old airplanes and it flies like a lot of old airplanes do. Rush says their mission is to promote aviation through history in a hands-on way. That looks like a lot of fun, Barbara. Something to do yes, this weekend. We were all a little jealous of the reporter <laughs> who went on that story. <laughs> That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUNews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members. Thank you.